Good morning. Good morning. Come on in. Come on in, beloved. You are welcome in this place. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We give God all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. To crucify the flesh. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, God. Because he's worthy to be praised. I tell you, I've been very, very busy getting ready for the book signing this morning. Getting ready for the book signing this morning. It's been a busy, busy week, a <laughs> couple of weeks. But I thank God to be with you this morning. Hallelujah. You are welcome in this place. Running behind this morning has some difficulties, but I am here ready to study the word of God with you. So we'll give people just a few more minutes. Hopefully they'll get on. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We give him all the glory, all the honor, all the praise because he's worthy to be praised. Amen. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We give him all the glory, all the honor, all the praise because he's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Many of the affliction of the righteous, but God's promised that he would deliver us out of them all. So we just trust him. The Bible said, trust in the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not to thy own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path. So Lord, we thank you right now. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. No matter what it looks like, no matter what we go through, we acknowledge you and you tell us to trust you. Help us in our weakness, God. Lead and guide us. And you said, God, in your word, when we don't know what to pray, that you're sitting on the right hand of the Father, making intercession on our behalf with groans and moanings that words could not utter. Lord, I pray for those who have lost their loved ones, Elder Hedden's uh, family. Lord, comfort them as they get prepared for that home going service. We're going to honor you and praise you doing that home going service because, Lord, he was your servant. And you gave him 90 long years. So, Lord, I pray as I get the call that this one passed, that one passed. I pray for those who have lost their loved ones. Sister Deborah, pray for their family as they lost their sister. 
the week, I believe the week after, Hedden, uh, Elder Hedden. So, Lord, just comfort those families. And then a call last night, ones that's supposed to be there, they lost their sister. So, Lord, you know, you know all about it. Comfort them as only you can. In the name of Jesus, wrap your arms around them. Oh, God, the Waters family, the, oh, hallelujah. Lord, I thank you. I thank you, God, that your, your, your power, your spirit is right there with those families. They feel your presence like never before. I pray that the peace which surpasses all understanding will guard their hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you for another opportunity. I thank you for another opportunity to study your word with your people. I thank you, God, for all the prophecy that you allowed to come my way to confirm what you've been saying to me in my prayer time. I thank you, God, that you are father, that you cannot lie. You said in your word that your word would not return unto us void, but it will accomplish what it set out to accomplish. Lord, I pray that people that listen to me, that's under the sound of my voice, they would take uh, 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 your word and allow it to take root in their lives, that they can mature in you and become walking epistles of your word. Oh God, you tell us, so graciously to study, to show thyself approved, a workman needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There comes a time that we have to be rooted and grounded in you. We can't be affected about, around, about, uh, uh, affected by what's around us, but we have to look up to the hills with coming by our help because all of our help coming from you, Father, in the name of Jesus. The name that's above every name. You said in your word, God, that every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, I thank you for the day that I can confess you as Savior. But God, you begin to take me and so many others on that journey of life. And then they begin to mature in the things of you. Of, of what you so have in the mature, which is your word, God, in the name of Jesus. That is my prayer, God, this morning, that the ones under the sound of my voice, they will continue to listen. But as they listen, they have made up their hearts and minds that they are going to allow the word to make a change in their life, that they're going to allow it to take root, God, that they will no longer, if they have done this, they will, will no longer just play around with it. Lord, they will be determined to grow in you. Lord, pleasing you. Don't worry about people around them. But please you, Father, in the name of Jesus. God, you tell us in your word that we're in this world. But we're not of this world. Hallelujah. Because when your spirit comes to reside on the inside of us, the one who created the world, the one who spoke it into existence. It comes to live on the inside of us. The change began to take place, but you want us to grow in your word, God. You want us to mature in your word, God, because you, it is no one like you, Father. In the name of Jesus, you want to build a relationship with us. Lord, we thank you. We honor you. And we know that life and death is in the power of the tongue. And I speak life. I have spoken life over our lives. So, Lord, take complete control of every entity of me. Move me out the way, this flesh, and allow your spirit to flow completely control. Take complete control of every entity of me. Lead God and order my steps, Holy Spirit. You are welcome in this place. There is no one like you. I give you glory. I give you honor. I give you praise in Jesus name. Amen and amen. Welcome, welcome to a journey into wholeness cathedral worldwide ministries. If there's anyone on here that's not haven't been on for a while or 
don't know me, I am the pastor of A Journey into Wholeness Cathedral Worldwide Ministries, which stems from my book, A Journey into Wholeness, where I talk about how God took me on my own journey. And he began to make the broken things in my life whole. Hallelujah. And it's still a process. I'm a, it, we'll become whole to the day we die. We're growing. But as we mature, and make up our hearts and minds, no matter what it looks like, no matter what we go through. We're going to put our trust in God. I promise you, we will make it. You will make it. Because his spirit resides on the inside of you. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I pray that each and every one, I thank God for each and every one of you waking up this morning. Being on this morning, clothed in your right mind, ready to study the word of God. Keith Burton, Burrell, thank you for tuning in. Continued prayer for you, brother. Kim, welcome, welcome. I hope to see you out today at this the book signing. It starts at 3 o'clock, and I've been sending it out. I didn't send it out this morning. Had some difficulties this morning, technical, and Whew, I've been so busy, but I thank God for being with you this morning. Sister Patricia, we love you, girl. We praying, hallelujah, although you're going through so many deaths, we are praying, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We thank God for Sister Kalita from Macon, Georgia, being here with us doing this book signing. We give God all the glory for safe travel. She traveled last night. Then we have one coming from Richmond, Virginia. I tell you, you guys are making my heart joyful. And I thank God for each and every one of you that has come back since uh, I've been away and back again. But I thank God. And I thank God for the new people. God is doing a new thing. And I'm excited so you'll hear me this morning and you'll hear me starting out this evening. And I tell you, I'm excited to be starting out this evening and talking about my new book. I'm going to tell you something about God, about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When he has purpose in your heart to do a thing, he prepares you and it's coming to pass. I wrote this book when I, before I even, before the tumor started to grow even bigger, you know, it was a thickening there. And I began to write the book. And so the book has been written and it's been sitting. And I had an editor look at it. My sister, the one that's going to be there for the ones who come, you will meet her. She referred me to an editor and she edited the book. So when I went and then uh, I began to have at the bottom of a journey into wholeness, a journey into matters of the heart, at the bottom of every chapter is where you can go and you can actually see the video of, of um, the chapters that you're reading. And it talks about when I, I was the host of matters of the heart. But the key thing I want you to get out of it is that when I was the host, little did I know that listening to these testimonies, and it was on public access in Greensboro, North Carolina, here in Greensboro, I was being, God was taking every, some areas of my life and healing through their testimony, that I need healing. So we all, we need one another. So when my sister and I was talking about this book signing, unification is the key for growth, came to me. And she prompt that because I, since I've been out of the hospital, I've been kind of dormant. I just been working and, you know, working with a lady and, 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 and I was, I was just laying dormant. And so she, she pushed those buttons and God began to uh, use the gifts that he so graciously have given me. And so I thank God and I humbly come before you this morning, ready to study the word of God, show you just how great our God is, even the more. Because it's not about Pastor Keith. It's about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm just available, vessel, willing to be used by God. And I want to encourage you, begin to pray and ask God, what is your gift? And begin to, if you need help, and if I can help any way, hallelujah, with, with words, you know, prayer and words and, and whatever the Holy Spirit leads me to do. Because to, to, to water that gift. Amen. 
And so a pastor's heart is to steward and pray over the sheep, to pray for the flock, amen, that's up, that's under his ministry. And, and I pray for a lot of people. People call me to pray and I need prayer. So I have the, 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 uh, pastors in the gospel. We, we touch and agree. Amen. We all, we need one another. Amen. To God be the glory. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Get your Bibles. Get your Bibles. We in the Song of Solomon. Amen. The Bible calls it the Song of Songs. The Song of Songs, chapter 3. But we're going to be covering chapter 3. We're going to go into chapter 4. And we'll start chapter 5. You say, Pastor, we're going to be here all day. No. Hallelujah. We're not going to be here all day. And we have a lot to do. Amen. We have a lot to do. The ones that said they were coming. Amen. I look forward to seeing you this evening. <clears throat> Hallelujah. For our review, we were made aware in Song of Songs chapter 2 that in relationships, it is good to reflect over the courtship. So that's what we talked about last Sunday. It is good if you're married and you courted your wife. It is good, brother and sister, to reflect over the courtship. <laughs> It prompts something in us. My sisters and brothers, I made us aware that I am led to do a teaching in the book of Song of Solomon. And Brother Eddie was with me a few years back when I was in the building, if it's been that long. I think it's been that long. Yeah, it's been about that long. And I did a teaching on Song of Songs. And I, and I had one pastor tell me, he said, uh, out of Raleigh, he said to me, he said, you bold. He said, I don't think I ever done a teaching out of Song of Songs. Well, we, we, I'll be a bold sister. <laughs> so my sisters and brothers, I was, um, we were made aware that um, I was led to do this teaching in the Song of Sol Solomon. So the next, for the next five Sundays, well, I think about four more Sundays, I pray that we have learned that God is the greatest teacher. Mm-hmm. He's the greatest teacher of love. He teaches us how to love our mates as well as others. And we learn how much he loves us. So what I hope and I pray that you've learned that thus far. I wish I told you that I wish I had known this years ago. But when you and I learn, we must wait patiently for God to send you and I, the one who knows how to love as well, or is open to learning how to love according to God's principles. Now, I'm going to tell you, when you're on this journey with God, temptation will come. Tests will come. God, he tests us sometimes. But he wants us to lean and depend on him. And the enemy, he's the prince of air, so he goes around seeking whom he may devour to get him to, off course because he listens when we pray. You say, Pastor, but what's the use? Well, well ask, that's why I say, ask God what's your gift. He might give you the gift of tongues, of speaking in tongues. You say, uh-oh, Pastor, I don't believe in that. Okay. The Holy Spirit, <laughs> he showed up during Pentecost. And then, and then, and then, and then ooh, hallelujah. And the power of the Holy Spirit came in that place. And they, they all spoke different languages, but they began to understand one another. So they were on one accord. They were unified in the body because a miracle had taken place by the Holy Ghost. The older, older folks say <laughs> the Holy Spirit. But I come back this morning to remind us that, oh, hallelujah. A lot of people don't, in the church, they say sex. They look at it as sin. But I come back to tell you this morning, God created it. So as we have been made aware and can agree that today's news, entertainment, and social media aggressively promotes the ideas that immorality means freedom. Perversion is natural. And, and commitment is old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. 
But I've come by to remind us that sex was created by God and was pronounced good in Eden. Just a reminder, Hebrews 13 verse 4 made us aware of this. And it reads as thus, it says, God designed for sex between a married man and a one man is good and honorable. In addition to this, see, I'm going to tell you something. God is not going to change his mind. He's not going to change his word. He is a God of love, but he's not going to go against what his word says. He said in Hebrews 13 verse 4, God designed for sex between a married man and a one man is good. And honorable. Mm -hmm. In addition to this, Genesis 2 verse 25 says, there is nothing shameful, dirty, or dishonorable about sex. In fact, it, in their state of innocence, the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. However, in this world, sex has been twisted exploited and turned into an urgent, illicit, casual, and self-gratifying activity. Love has turned into lust, giving, to, giving into getting and lasting commitment into no strings attached. If you agree with it, say amen. I know you didn't hurt it, but sometimes we got to hear it over habitually to get it rooted and grounded in our spirit man. Sexual intercourse, according to the word of God, is the physical and emotional union of male and female. And it is actually a holy means of celebrating love, producing children and experiencing pleasure. And it is protected by the commitment of marriage. God is the creator of sex and recognizes its importance. Hallelujah. I guess you say amen. Yes, amen. Scripture contains numerous guidelines for its use and warnings about misuse. Yes, sex can be misused. Mm -hmm. Beloved, sex in the book of Song of Songs is always mentioned in the context of a loving relationship between husband and wife. Husband and wife. Amen. Mm -hmm. As we studied this series, we will continue to learn that the book of Song of Songs highlights the intimate story of a man and woman that narrates their love, courtship, and marriage. I come by to tell you, ladies, allow, be determined to allow the man to court you. Mm hmm. Gotta be courted. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's what the word tells us. He gives us an example here. I made us aware that we read this book. As we read this book, we will realize that it is a moving story, drama, and poem. It is a dialogue between a young Israelite woman, the, Shula, the uh, Shulamite woman, and her lover, King Solomon. They describe in intimate detail their feeling for each other and their longings to be together. Beloved, we were also made aware that this book is both a historical story with two layers of meaning. One, on one level, we learned about love, marriage, and sex. And on the other level, we will see God's overwhelming love for his people. Now for the new information. The title of the message this morning, The, int the, the Intensity of Love. The intensity of love. The question I would like for you to ponder, do you believe that love between a husband and wife can be intoxicating, which is created by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Love between a husband and wife can be intoxicating. Mm -hmm. The scripture reference Song of Songs chapter 3. But as I previously stated, we will cover some of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5. We will not go over time because these are short chapters. Verse 1 of 1 through 4 of Song of Songs 3 talks about the bride's troubled dream. The Shilamite bride. This is what she says. I hope you have it now. Song of Songs chapter 3. This is the Shulamite bride speaking to us. And this is what she said. She said, on my bad, bad night after night, I dreamed that I sought the one whom my soul loves. I sought him but did not find him. 
So she can sit in a bad dream. She loved this man. Verse 2, I said, so I must arise now and go out into the city, into the streets and into the squares, places I do not know. I must seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I did not find him. The watchmen who go around the city found me. And I said, have you seen him whom my soul loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found him whom my soul loves. She said in chapter four, scarcely. So she was scared as had I passed them when I found him whom my soul loves. I held on to him and would not let him go until I had brought him to my mother's house and into the chambers of her who conceived me. Beloved, it is evident that the woman desperately wanted to be with her lover. What we, can, what, we, we, what we have just read shows that her desire for him was so intense that she was willing to risk her personal safety to go out into the city at night to search for him. Mm -hmm. We all have a deep longing to be needed and desired. If you've been married for a while, do you still desire your spouse? Mm. If so, make sure to tell him or her. If your desire has dec decreased, ask God to give you a deep desire and longing for your spouse. Let me get a little personal. I've been married and I was very much in love with my husband. However, life has a way of bringing things up and you make it and then sometime you make it. I wish I knew some of this was in the Bible at that time. Uh-huh. But I found when I, when I studied this and you, every relationship goes through seasons. Mm -hmm. For the ones that have been married a long time, you know what I'm talking about. We have our ups and downs. So if the desire, so uh, uh, Solomon said, if the desire has this decreased, ask God to give you a deep desire and longing for your spouse. It brought things back to my remembrance. I could be remember being on my knees saying those words because every marriage goes through a season. Beloved, like the two lovers are drawn to one another, so Jesus is drawn to his people. Paul paints a beautiful picture of the deep love and desire Jesus has to his bride, the church, uh -huh. which is to be a model for the kind of desire husbands and wives should have for each other. I tell you, Ephesians 5 verse 25 through, 12, 20, 25 through 27 is evident of this. And this is what it says. It says, husbands, love your wives. Seek the highest good for her and surround her with a caring, unselfish love. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word of God. I tell you, the man has a great responsibility to his wife so so that in, in turn, he might present the church to himself in glorious splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy, set apart for God and blameless. Beloved, Paul is saying here mm -hmm, that Christ's death is what makes the church holy and clean. If you don't know this morning, Jesus died on the cross for you and I, if you never heard it, but I believe everybody has, for you and I. So he went to the cross for us. What was meant for us? It goes all the way back to Genesis. Huh? And, and Adam said, it was that woman you gave me. He blamed her. But the responsibility laid on the man. So that's when mankind has been, who oh God, had to take that, we had to take it on our shoulders. Sin, but God, the love of God. <laughs> he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you and I because he loved us. 
He came down. He wrapped them up in flesh, in, in the flesh. Ha uh ha. -huh. Came down here so he could identify what we would go through. But he felt that thing. Beloved, he felt it. He hung up there. And I remember reading. It says, he said, Lord, if it be thy will, let this cup pass for me. He said, but not thy will, but your will be done. And he, be, he, stood, he just stayed there. But he felt the anguish that you perhaps feel sometimes. So Paul is saying here that Christ's death is what makes the church holy and clean. He cleanses us from the old, cleanses us from the old ways of sin and sets us apart for his special sacred service. If you agree with it, say amen. Well, if you don't agree with it, I'm going to give you some evidence. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30 makes us aware of this. And this is what it says. It said, but it is from him that you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, revealing his plan of salvation and righteousness, meaning making us acceptable to God and sanctification, making us holy and setting us apart for God and redemption, providing our ransom from the penalty for sin. Do you understand what I'm saying? He paid the price for us. Beloved, Paul is saying here, that skill and wisdom do not get a person into God's kingdom. It is simple faith. That seed, that's only a mustard seed. <laughs> Hallelujah. So it is simple faith. No one can boast that personal achievements help him or her to secure eternal life. Salvation comes totally from God through Jesus' death and resurrection. We can do nothing to earn it. We need only accept what he has done. I tell you, when we accept Christ as our Savior, and then we begin to go through our own journey, through our own process, hallelujah, and we begin to mature in the things of God, hallelujah, we begin, no matter what we're doing, we rest in him because we know he's going to take care of us. We know that he's going to lead and guide us. I tell you, during this process of getting ready for this book signing, we've been doing this and doing that. But you know, <laughs> I have rested, I have learned to rest in it. Because before, as you grow on this, on this journey with God, you want things this way and that way. And we just get so caught up because we're being our gift. But if we just stop and rest, in him, we can be resting physically, and he'll speak to us and begin to talk to our spirit man as we're resting and leading and guiding us what to say and what to do. Hallelujah. I tell you, it's nothing like building that relationship with him, that you are connected. I always say you're connected to the lifeline, which is the Holy Scripture. He will lead and guide you. That's what I say. The Bible says that he is divine and we are the branches. Hallelujah. And as we stay connected to the vine, we will grow. Amen. So we can do nothing to earn it. We need to only accept what he has done. Amen. Furthermore, my sisters and brothers, Christ, hallelujah, cleanse the church by washing of baptism, by the washing of baptism. Through baptism, we are prepared for entrance into the church, just as an ancient, listen to me, just as an ancient Middle Eastern bride, Eastern bride would be prepared for marriage by a ceremonial bath. It is God's word that cleanses us. Hallelujah. John 17, verse 17, is further evidence of this. And, and John puts it like this. He said, sanctify them in, in the truth. Set them apart for your purposes. Make them holy. Your word is truth. Beloved, when we become born again, we become followers of Jesus Christ. We become sanctified. 
meaning set apart for sacred use, cleansed and made holy, hallelujah, by believing, by believing, by believing and obeying and obeying the word of God. Also in Hebrews 4 verse 12, which says, for the word of God is living. I remember going to, well, let me, let me leave that alone. Let me, I get back to that. <laughs> Hebrews 4 verse 12 says this, for the word of God is living and active and full of power. And I'm reading from the Amplified, making it operative, energizing and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating, hallelujah, penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit, the completeness of a person and of both joints and marrow, the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word of God, beloved, gives us more than simple a collection of words from God. A vehicle for communication, communicating his ideas. It has living, life-changing, and dynamic power that works in us. With the, who, hallelujah. Mm. Hallelujah. When the, with the incisiveness of a surgeon's knife. God, God's word reveals who we are and what we do not know and what we're not. So with the incision of a surgeon's knife, God's word reveals who we are and what we are not. Hallelujah. It deserves both the good and the evil within us. This is what this scripture is saying. It deserves both the good and the evil within us. God's powerful word will change us. However, we must not only listen to it, but we must also let it transform our lives. We must come to the realization that we have received forgiveness through Jesus' sacrificial death and learn that daily, see, we got to come to the realization that he died. We can't, he died for you and I. So we have to forgive ourselves of anything that we might have said or done. Hallelujah. Because the enemy wants to keep you there. But I come by to tell you, my sister. I come by to share with you, my brother, that forgiveness, forgiveness, forgive yourself. Because God has done it. Once you confess it. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, but you find it hard. See, we can't earn this thing. It's a gift from God. Woo! We got to come to the realization that we have received forgiveness through Jesus' sacrificial death. And learn that daily application, this is, this is what I love. Daily application of God's word has a purifying effect on our minds and hearts. You say, Pastor, what you're saying? In other words, scripture points out sin, motivate us to confess it, renews our relationship with God, and guides us back to the right path. Hallelujah. Woo. Scripture points out sin, motivates us to confess it, renews our relationship with God, and guides us back to the right path. If you agree with it, say amen or type amen. Verse 28 through 30 of Ephesians 5 goes on to say, talking about husband and wives, even so husbands should and, and are morally obligated to love their own wives as being in a sense their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own body. But instead, he nourishes and protects and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members, meaning parts of his body. Verse 25 through 30 of Ephesians 5, Paul devotes twice uh, 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 as many words to telling husbands to love their wives as to telling wives to submit to their husbands. 
The question that comes to mind is how should a man love his wife? He should be willing, number one, he should be willing to sacrifice everything for her. You said, Pastor, wait a minute. I'm just telling you what the words say. <laughs> so number one, he should be willing to sacrifice everything for her. Number two, make her well-being of primarily importance. Make her well-being of primary importance. And number three, care for her as he cares for his own body. No wife needs to fear or resist submitting to a man who treats her in this way. I come by to tell you, my brother, your wife will submit to you if you just do these things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you do these things, if you sacrifice everything for her, make her well-being of primary importance and care for her as, as you care for your own body. She will submit. She will submit to you. Hallelujah. Say amen, ladies. <laughs> Verse 31 of Ephesians 5 goes on to say this. It says, for this reason, a man should leave his father and mother and shall be joined and be faithfully devoted to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. Verse 32, the, this mystery of two becoming one is great. But I'm speaking with reference to the relationship of Christ and the church. This is Paul talking. However, each man among you, without exception, is to love his wife as his very own self. Hallelujah. With behavior worthy of respect and esteem, always seeking the best for her with the attitude of loving kindness. I tell you, and the wife must see to it. That she respects and delights in her husband. That she notices him and prefers him and treats him with loving concern. Treasuring him, honoring him, and holding him dear. Beloved, Paul wanted to show the world through Christian marriage that something new and good was taking place. He saw marriage not as a practical necessity or a cure for lust, but as a picture of the relationship between Christ and his church. Keep walking with me. Paul's counsel to the Ephesians teaches the biblical idea of marriage. Marriage for Paul, beloved, was a holy union, a living symbol, a precious relationship needing tender, self-sacrificing care. We are talking about the intensity of love. So, beloved, in verse 1 through 4 of chapter 3, many believe that in these verses, the young woman is recalling the dream. That calls her to become so concerned about her lover's whereabouts. That she, she arose in the middle of the night to search for him. We are made aware here that when we love someone, we will do all we can to ensure the safety of that person. And care for his or her needs. Even at a cost to our personal comfort. If you agree with it, say amen. Beloved, this shows up most often in small actions. For example, offering to get your spouse a glass of water, leaving work early to attend a function your child is involved in, or sacrificing your personal comfort to tend to the needs of a friend. Hallelujah. Keep walking with me. Verse 4 of Song of Songs goes on to say this. It says, I command that you take an oath, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the doses of the field, that you do not, do not rouse nor awaken my love until she pleases. Woo, let me calm down a little bit. The young woman expressed her desire, beloved, for her lover, which was so strong, meaning it intensive, that she would leave her home to search for him. She loved him, loved, she looked for him at night, which is a dangerous time to walk around the city. Beloved, the description of this event 
ends with the second warning not to arouse or awaken love until it so desires. In marriage, spouses are to love one another enough to be willing to sacrifice their well-being for the other. The young woman warns her friends again that they should not rush in such a relationship. Verse 6 through 5, verse 1. The scene changes. Some believers that who some believe that the wedding possession is described in Song of Songs 3, 6 to 11, which reads as thus, and this is the Shulamite bride, as she describes the procession of her wedding. This is what she says. Whoo, glory. What is this coming up from the wilderness like stately pillars of smoke, perfumed with mirth and frankincense, with all the fragrant patterns of merchant? Verse 7, behold, it is the couch of Solomon, 60 mighty men around it, of the mighty men of Israel. All of them handle the sword, all expect, all expert in war. Each man has his sword at his, at his thigh, guarding against the terrors of the night. Verse 9, King Solomon has made for himself, hallelujah, a palaquin from the cedar wood of Lebanon. Verse 7, beloved, and 9, Solomon courage, this case was probably a covered curtain couch on which a single passenger would be carried on men's shoulders. So he created this. I believe he created it for himself. And the Bible said, <laughs> hallelujah, it was covered with a curtain, curtain couch on which a single passenger, which is him, would be carried on a man, on, men, on the men's shoulder. Verse 10, go, 10 goes on to say, of, of Song of Solomon, it says this, he made it, he made its post of silver, its back of gold, and uh, its seat of purple cloth, the interior lovely and intricately raw by the daughters of Jerusalem. Go forth, O daughters of Zion, and gaze on King Solomon wearing the crown with which his mother Bathsheba has crowned him on the day of his wedding. On the day of his gladness of heart. My sisters and brother, verse 6 to 11 describes the wedding night. As we continue to read, we learn that chapter 4, 1 through 5, uh, 1 through chapter 5, verse, verse 1 describes the consummation of the marriage. I told you we'll be covering 3, 4, and 5, starting in 5. We're talking about the intensity of love. Another explanation is that the period of Solomon's engagement to the young woman is being remembered in the previous section, sections that we've covered. Chapter 2, verse 8 through chapter 3, verse 5 of Solomon, Song of Solomon. And the young lady fell in love. Chapter 2, verse 8, eight reads as follows, and I repeat. The Shulamite bride says this. She says, listen, my beloved. Behold, he comes, climbing the mountains, leaping and running on the hills. Beloved, I made us aware that the Shulamite bride is reflecting on her courtship with Solomon. We talked about that last Sunday, amen? Chapter 3, verse 5, the bridegroom says this. See, they said they they talking sweet to one another and <laughs> doing the courtship. It says, I command that you take an oath, O daughters of Jerusalem, by, by the gazelle or by the doves of the field, that you do not rouse nor awaken my love until she pleases. She expressed her desire for his love, which was intoxicating, that she would leave her home to search for him, even during the night. So we see why the chapters are reminding us not to arouse or awaken love until it so de desires. Because it is intoxicating. 
Chapter 2, the end, and I'm reading from the NIV, puts it like this, and I repeat. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the doles of the field, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. The young woman encourages not only her friends, but us to not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Why do you think she says that? She says that because love is very powerful. When we give ourselves, you know, the Bible tells us to guard our heart with all diligence because out of it flows the issues of life. So we have to be very careful. Hallelujah. We have to be ready. Amen. Beloved, Solomon returns to her in all his royal splendor, expresses his great love. He expresses his great love, beloved, to her. When he returns, she went to look for him. Amen? <laughs> for her in chapter 4, verse 1 through 5, which states, he says this, How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from the hills of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shone coming up from the washing. Each has its, its twin, not one of them alone. Your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of pomegranate. Your neck is like the tower of David, built with courses of stone. On it hang a thousand shields. All of them shields are warriors. Your breasts are like two farms, like two farms of the gazelle that brought that broads among the lilies. <laughs> Beloved, I believe that some of us may feel awkward on lookers when we read the intensity, the intensely private and intimate exchange. In the ecstasy of their love, the lovers praise each other using beautiful imagery. Their words may seem strange to readers from a different culture, but their intense feelings of love and admiration are worldwide. If you understand what I'm saying, say amen or type amen. My sisters and brothers communicating love and, and expressing admiration in both words and actions can enhance every marriage for life and enable couples to experience the deepest possible joy and in sexual intimacy. Amen. Verse 7 through 15 of chapter 4 of Song of Songs. And this is when King Solomon proposes. And it reads as follows. You are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no flaw in you. Come with me from Lebanon. My bride, come with me from Lebanon. Descend from the crest of Amana, from the top of Sinir, the summit of Hermon from the lion's den and the mountain hawks of leopards. You have stolen my heart. She, he tells her, he said, you have stolen my heart, my daughter, my bride. You have stolen my heart with one glance of your eyes. Hallelujah. With one jewel of your ne necklace. How delightful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much more pleasing is your love than wine and the fragrance of your perfume more than any spice. Your lips drop sweetness as the honeycomb. My bride, milk and honey are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fra fragrance of Lebanon. You are a garden locked up. He said, you are a garden locked up. <coughs> my sister, my bride, you are a spring enclosed, a sealed fountain. Stop here for a moment. And comparing his bride to a locked gar garden, Solomon was praising her virginity. He was praising her virginity. But be beloved, as we know, now virginity considered old-fashioned by many in today's culture. But it always been God's plan for unmarried people and with his good reason. Hallelujah. Sex without marriage is cheap lacks sacred intimacy, and destroys trust. It does not compare with the peace, security, and trust of giving yourself completely to the one who is totally committed to you in marriage. Mm. 
Verse 13 through 15 goes on to say, this is what it says. It says your plants are in, are in orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits, with henna and nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with every kind of incense incense tree with myrrh and and alums and all the finest spices. You are a an area garden fountain, a well of flowing water streaming down from Lebanon. Beloved, beloved Solomon's bride was a refreshing was as refreshing to him as a garden fountain or stream. That's that's what he's saying there. So I have a question for you. Could your spouse say the same about you? Maybe a little different. In this time, in this in this time, <laughs> sometimes the familiarity that comes with marriage causes us to forget the overwhelming feelings of love and refreshment we shared at the beginning. Beloved, many marriages could use a course in refreshing. Do we do you refresh your spouse or are you a burden of complaints, sorrow and problems? Do you refresh your spouse? You got to. Ponder this. Amen. Partners in marriage should continually work at refreshing each other with things like encouraging word, an encouraging word, an unexpected gift, a change of pace, a surprise call or note, or even withholding discussions of certain problems until the proper time. Mm. I come by to tell you, if we stay connected to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit will lead and guide us even in our marriages. Beloved, your spouse needs you to be a haven of refreshment because the rest of the world usually isn't. Your home should be a safe haven for you and your spouse. Amen? Verse 16 of Song of Songs 4, the woman joyfully accepts. She accepts his proposal. And this is what she says, awake north wind and come south wind and come south wind, blow on my garden that its fragrance may spread everywhere. Let my beloved come into his garden and taste its, its choice fruits. Oh, Jesus. This is evident that the woman joyfully accepts to be Solomon's wife. Last chapter five, verse one. Solomon celebrates with great exuberance. And this is what he says. I have come into my garden, my sister, my promised bride. I have gathered my mirror along with my balsam and spice from your sweet words. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, friends, drink and drink deeply, O oh lovers. Solomon is very much in love with his bride, and we are taught the importance of what we say in our marital relationship is good. It's very important. Amen? Well, I come by to remind us that our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ is also married to his bride, which is the church. He's married to the church. Christ, the bridegroom, has sacrificially and lovingly chosen the church to be his bride. According, and we just read it according to Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Just as there was a, a period in biblical time during which the bride and groom were separated until the wedding, so is the bride of Christ separated from her bridegroom during the church age. Her responsibility during this time is to be faithful to him. Our responsibility is to be faithful to our bridegroom, which is Jesus Christ, until the coming of Jesus, which is the wedding. We can identify it as the wedding ceremony. Hallelujah. Until it takes place, the eternal union of Christ and his bride will be actualized according to Revelations 9, 7 through 9. Amen. I have a question for you. Are you the church? Are you the church? Are you determined to mature in the things of God? Get saved. Allow his spirit to reside on the inside of you. And at that moment, if he decides to come back and take you home, 
You will be, the Bible said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. But you get saved. Make up your mind and heart. Because you're excited when you first get saved. Make up your mind and heart that you're going to get connected to a Bible believing teaching ministry and begin to grow in the things of God. Amen. If you don't know him today, I want to give you an invitation. Romans 10, 9 and 10. He said, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, thou shall be saved. So we confess and we believe. Repeat after me if you don't know. Him. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need a savior. After listening to this word about love and how this woman desired her love and how they spoke kindly to one another and intimate to one another, I want to grow so in you, God, learn of you so I can have that. If it's your will, Father. So I confess with my mouth that I believe that you sent your only begotten son to die on the cross for me. But on the third day, he rose again. I confess it and I believe it with my heart. By faith, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Welcome into the family of God. The angels of the Lord are, are praising God, are rejoicing because you gave your, yourself to Christ today. Amen. If you've been on this journey a while and you've allowed the pressures and distractions to take you away from God and you're listening to this message today. Acts 3 verse 19 said, repent therefore and be converted. Hallelujah. You can be converted. Mm. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he promised that a time of refreshing will come from the Lord. So repent today. Ask God to change your attitude, your thoughts, your plans. Return back to him. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I repent. I change my attitude, my way of thinking. Help me, Lord, in my weakness. I need you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Welcome back into the family of God. We are rejoicing if you come back to the Lord. And we here to support you and to pray with you and encourage you. We, we're not here. I don't have it. We're not here to talk about you. We love, we loving on you. Amen. We loving on you. Because I know how it is to be talked about. And people think you don't even know it. And they just in your face. But you know what? When you have a relationship with God. <laughs> he put an unction in your spirit. When something's not right. And something's wrong. And then sometimes he said, I want you to show them love. Demonstrate it. Amen. You demonstrate it. But you don't let anyone just walk up. Why am I going here? Just, just walk over you. Because he'll tell you when to shake the dust from your feet and go on. <laughs> so Keith, Burnell, Kim, Patricia, Sister Patricia, Elder, I mean, Eddie Fields. Hallelujah. We thank God for each and every one of you. Sister Michelle, I believe, is on here. My sister Michelle, she's on here. Thank God. But well, we thank God for each and one, every one of you listening, the ones on the line. We thank God for you, you, and you. I pray that you will join us this evening. We have a quite a few that has RSVP and told me they were coming. So we thank God for the ones that have said they were coming. We give God all the glory, all the honor, all the praise for those who are coming and fellowshipping with us and supporting my sister Michelle and myself as God has so graciously allowed us to write these books. Um, I thank God. So be there. Come and support us. Unification is the key for growth. Being a unified body in the name of Jesus. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your word. 
that you've hidden in our heart that we might not sin against you. We ask God that it would take root in our hearts, our minds, our souls, that we will be more like you. We find it out just how you are, God, even as it relates to marriage, relationship, just how intimate you are, the way you want us to talk and love on each other. So, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we ask you for strength to go forth this evening in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this opportunity to serve others and show them that they, too, can overcome certain things in their lives. They too can go to the next level that God is so graciously. No matter what goes on in their life, it might they might have a setback. God is a God that prepares us. As I had a setback in my health, but Lord, you allowed me to prepare that book before the setback. And it just sat on the shelf. It sat on my computer. And then I got motivated by my sister saying, where is the manuscript? Hallelujah. So, God, you've taught me, you've taught us so many things that you are the provider. You are our strength. You are everything. Lord, you know, we, you just want us to sub, co submit ourselves, commit ourselves to you, God. Obey you. Obey your word and study and be all that you will have us to be. So, Lord, we thank you for another opportunity to study your word with your people. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. There is no one like you, God. We serve a mighty God, Prince of Peace, Abba Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You be blessed, my sister. Be blessed. I will see some of you this evening. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm looking forward to just seeing you and hugging your neck and breaking bread with you this evening. To God be the glory. Blessed be the name of the Lord. For the ones that's coming, I will see you at three o'clock. Be blessed until, let me see, Tuesday night. <laughs> Hallelujah. 730, we'll be ready to con continue our study in the four gospels of Jesus Christ. I tell you, I enjoy studying the word of God with you. Be blessed, my sister. Be blessed, my brother, until Tuesday night. Have a blessed rest of the week.